Now we're going to move into the classical period. And so the next 160 years really established the idea of beauty that has endured to now. And even today, the trajectory of Western art harkens back to the Greeks. And so this period is sort of framed by the defeat of the Persians in 479 BCE, and then ends in the death of Alexander in 323. So transitional or early classical is a time between 480 to 450, just 30 years, and then 5th century from 450 to 400, and then 4th century classical is a little later, 400 to 323. And so there's a rapid series of events that happens in Greek period in history during this period. So concepts that begin to arise at this time period, we see humanism, rationalism, idealism. Statements like man is the measure of all things, know thyself, nothing in excess. The concept of reason over emotion, that all aspects of life have meaning and pattern and nothing happens by accident. They grounded their art in very close observation as nat of nature, as we've already seen. And this observation of nature becomes their benchmark for quality. This division of periods corresponds to historical events and also it's a frame through which we can discuss these artistic styles. So in this early classical, we see a little bit of a new direction in the representation of human consciousness. And when we get to vase paintings, you know, you're going to see this in the vase paintings from the archaic period as well. I have a separate presentation for you that's just on the vase paintings. I think it's easier to understand that all together. So you will be seeing that. And we're going to see transitions in style very clearly on the pediments of the Temple of Aphia and Aegina. So that's why I'm going to sort of concentrate on that temple now. And this island has fought on, off and on with Athens for over two centuries, so 200 years. And they had their final battle between four, 500 and 490. So 10 years, and they ended up calling a truce, and they joined with Athens as an ally, which was a good thing, because all of Greeks actually ended up having to unify to defeat Xerxes. So they had success against the invasion of the Persians. It gave them self-confidence, and it also accelerated their artistic development. So we see artists portray the human figure with even greater ac accuracy than we have before. Now. Of course, like everything else, there is a decline. The democracy in Athens didn't last all that long. Corruption entered, and the Spartans didn't like the way the Athens were managing things. So we ended out with a conflict between Sparta and Athens, which ended up in the Peloponnesian Wars, which ended with defeat of Athens. Pericles dominated Athenian politics. and But for its short time, Athens was a shining star in Greek culture, and it originated originally far before it was the center of Greek culture. It was actually an Acropolis, which is just a city on a hill. So that becomes the Acropolis where the Parthenon is that we know about. That sort of becomes this religious sanctuary. It becomes a fortress, and the social life revolves completely around the marketplace on the Acropolis in the Agora. So I've got some links here for you about the Temple of Aphaia. And here's a diagram and a reconstruction drawing of the Acropolis. And you can actually see the Temple of Aphaia is on the island of Aegina. So from the Acropolis, you can look across and you can see the Temple of Aphaia from the top of the hill in the Acropolis. Here's where the Parthenon is. So to build this Acropolis, they used 22,000 tons of marble. And there was a sculptor actually named Phidias, and he was responsible for most of the work for this Acropolis, the Parthenon's at the top. So the other thing I wanna say about this is you can see from this reconstruction drawing and all these different buildings, again, all of the sculpture that's gonna be in each one of these different ones. Here's the Temple of Athena Nike down here. Of course, this is the Parthenon up here and we'll get to some of the sculptures on that. So again, as we saw in the archaic sculpture, 
The sculptures would be made individually and then they would be put up into the metopes or the pediment or wherever they're going to go on any different building. This is an early classical wounded warrior and he is from actually the Temple of Aphaea and it's a good example. Again, remember we talked about this idea of pediment sculpture and this construct of the dying warrior in the corner of the pediment. So this particular pediment that he is from depicts the sack of Troy. So this warrior is struggling to rise. He would have been painted, he would have been filled with bronze accessories, which are of course been looted, but the corner of the pediment would be down here by where his foot is. And you can see in this very subtle twisting, modeling, turning. So we've got a great deal more movement than we saw in these early Koros figures here. Here's some more sculpture from the Temple of Aphaea. Again, these archers, but notice the study of anatomy, the articulation of the knee, the turn of the foot, the strength in the arm as he holds the bow, that he's pulling the arm back, the concentration in the gaze. This is a Doric temple in the sanctuary of Hera and Zeus, and it was completed a little bit earlier, the temple itself. It's de all decorated with imported marble, but the sculptures appear to be from a little bit later period, and we've got images of Apollo helping the Lapiths in a battle with the centaurs. And so on this west pediment, we have again, twisting, turning, writhing figures, and we have Apollo in the center. He's celebrating the triumph of reason over barbarism. So this classic subject matter. So this is a metope relief from the frieze of the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. And we've got Heracles here. He's holding up the heavens. Atlas is fetching the apples for him. And Athena is helping him hold up the sky. And this is a new thing that we're seeing as well is this interaction between the figures. The strength of Heracles holding up the heavens. The straining of his muscles. The concentration on Atlas the gaze of Athena. Now this is another chorus figure and you're gonna be like, wait a minute, I thought they were all archaic, but this is an early classical figure, make no mistake, but it is a chorus figure. They think it's done by the sculptor Critios, which is why it's called the Critian boy, but there's no trace of the archaic smile here. And you can tell that it's a young man, very soft modeling on the figure. These bronze warriors were found on the seafloor off the coast of Rias in Italy, and they date to about 460 as well. Now the bronze warriors are somewhat of an anomaly because again, oftentimes bronze might be taken and melted and made into other sculptures or weapons. So it's sort of hit and miss how many bronze warriors there actually were, but it's clearly belongs to classical. You can see the articulation, the emphasis, they've got the date for 460 here. So the narrative on the east and west pediments in the Temple of Aphaea illustrates the battle of the Greeks and the Trojans, and we've already seen the dying warrior, so we've got a precursor of a glimpse to this. The central figure, of course, is the goddess Athena, and this temple is way out on the rocky ridge out of the island's northeast corner so from that Acropolis that we've just seen, the Athenians can stand up and look over and see this temple. So this is symbolic of this new relationship between Aegina and Athens. The pediments were sculpted about 10 years apart. And so this top image is an archaic dying warrior. And this is, again, a wonderful illustration of this transition that we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, where you can see the beaded hair of the archaic, the archaic smile, the sort of otherworldly achievement of perfection that we saw as exemplified in the two young men that were carrying their mother in the oxen cart, that he has died at the peak of his duty, at the peak of his humanity. And in the early classical sculpture at the bottom from the west pediment, this tends to be more emotion, he's twisting, he's turning. We can see a little bit of the agony of the warrior in this one. So it's more dramatic. So it's more of one stage in a series of events that we begin to have part of a narrative, if you will. And that narrative is one that we saw in the previous Metope sculpture with Athena, Atlas, and Heracles. So I think the, the last thing that I would want to say about the Christian boy is 
if you place the Christian boy next to the early chorus figures, like for example, the New York chorus, if you flip back to the other presentation with the New York chorus in it, and then flip up to this one, you can see side by side that all of a sudden this becomes a great deal more animated. He's stepping farther forward. Their archaic smile is gone. There's actually the expression of a young man here. And the figure is softly modeled. We have a better idea exactly how old he is. It's moved from a quintessential all human to almost a specific portrait that perhaps it really is a portrait of a specific person. There is concentration and intelligence here that is absent from the earlier figures. And a lot of it just has to do with the fact of how much the Greeks have learned over the centuries about how to create this. The same thing applies to these Rios warriors, which again, they're idealized anatomical forms but when you look at the expression on the face, you can see that there's a move toward knowledge. And we're going to see this idea of emotion or pathos in the Hellenistic age toward the end as well. So the lines get blurred. They overlap a little bit. Carrying on with what I said about the use of bronze, again, this is a charioteer from the sanctuary of Apollo, and we looked at him in the first lecture as well, but he belongs here, which is why I put him back in here again. So he would have been up, uh, up above the heads of everyone holding the reins to a chariot. So as the throng moved toward Delphi, they saw these charioteers up above them. And he's wearing clothes, which is also interesting because most of the figures that are just showing a humanity would have been figures that were nude and showing the athletic prowess, for example. But this one has a specific role or a specific function. We don't have too many examples of this because they recycle their bronze. So if you carry that idea of the New York Koros or even the Anavisos Koros compared to the Critian boy through to these two dying warriors, you can see that some of the same parallels apply. We have the archaic smile in this figure up here. He's, he's not a Koros figure, but he has the same archaic ideals that the Koros figure has. The early classical figure, he's not a Koros figure, but like the Christian boy or like the charioteer, he has some he has specific trappings appropriate to his station, to his occupation, that there is emotion, there is concentration. He's part of a narrative. Early classical statues tend to be dramatic, and so they tend to be distinct stages that the narrative is generally shown as a series of events. So, I don't know whether you can see the Parthenon from the Temple of Aphaea, although you can see the Temple of Aphaea from the Parthenon. So now we'll go back to Athens and we'll go to the Parthenon. Again, I showed this to you once before, this diagram, this reconstruction drawing of the Acropolis. And so here is the Parthenon that we just looked at right at the top of the hill. Here's, of course, our stadiums over here and different sanctuary for Artemis. There's an armory the old temple of Athens, the large statue of Athena. So, so many different buildings, all for specific uses. The Greeks continue to carry this idea of separating out buildings, one for each reason. So it's a group of separate buildings that creates one harmonious whole. The Parthenon is a reflection of the triumph of Athens over Persia. It honors Athena and the triumph of civilization over barbarism. All of the pediments had sculpture in the round at one time, but most of it's been lost, so they're trying to reconstruct what was there. The sculptors used the locations of the pinholes in the shelves to try to reconstruct how it would have been arranged. These marble sculptures came from the east pediment of the Parthenon, and they're known as the Elgin marbles, and there's a long story about where their location is. I'm pretty sure Stockstead talks about it. They represent the goddess Hestia and her mother Dione. So earlier when we looked at the Kore figures, I talked about the drapery and how important it was to the Greeks to study these things. And that this sculpture is now articulating the beauty of the female form underneath the drapery. So there is an expression to this that's absent in the earlier sculptures.
Here's a metope relief from the Parthenon of the Centaurs and the Lapiths. Marshals and young women, 